Hello, everyone, and welcome to Light Talk. What you are about to hear is the actual broadcast in totality of the keynote event at the ETC International Workshop broadcast on July 11th, 2018. All the sounds that you may hear are the byproducts of this event. Please be assured that no animals were harmed during the recording of the show. So sit back and enjoy episode 66 when the Lumen Brothers interview ETC's CEO, Fred Foster. Life Talk. to the first official day of Workshop 2018. I'm David Linscom, Vice President of Marketing at ETC, and this morning we have a very special event. We are very happy to have a podcast going out live from ETC here, a podcast really about lighting culture. <laughs> it started with a guy who wanted to buy moving lights, who asked another guy who had some moving lights, and somehow it ended up as a top 10 podcast in the world. Over 4,000 downloads a month, reaching 79 countries. The Lumen Brothers. Does this make me an honorary Lumen Brother? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I'm gonna start the way we usually start it. Uh, this is Stan, and I'm broadcasting from ETC's very state-of-the-art room at the Hilton Monona Terrace in beautiful downtown Madison, Wisconsin. And I'm Steve, normally in Dallas, but here I am in Madison, Wisconsin. And this is David, broadcasting from my mountain chateau, very high up in the Rockies in Central City, Colorado. And we are the Lumen Brothers! <laughs> we are. <laughs> your phone. And, and turn off your phone stand. <laughs> it was off. This, this it was time. off. Anyway, uh, and, uh, and my brothers are there with you guys, so it's like a great crowd. Uh, so why don't you tell us, uh, Steve, what's going on? Well, here we are. We're interviewing uh, founder and CEO of ETC, Fred Foster. Uh, and to kind of add a little twist to this, we're live streaming today on YouTube, courtesy of ETC. Um, Stan, there's probably one or two people on the planet left that do not know who Fred Foster is. Could you give them a little bio information? I'm going to try and read this as best I can, so uh, bear with me. Fred Foster is ETC's founder and CEO, and while studying at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the 70s and being mentored by lighting design luminary Gilbert Helmsley Jr., Foster and his brother, Bill, Gary Bewick and James Bradley developed a groundbreaking lighting control console for the theater, the Mega Q, in Foster's apartment. Over time, Fred has performed virtually all the roles for ETC, from original inventor engineer to industrial designer, tech support, salesman, marketer, chief operating officer to president and now CEO. Foster focuses his CEO energies not only on ETC's global strategy and product development, but on the cohesiveness of the internal ETC community and ETC's role in the external community. He's also the prime force behind ETC's student mentoring and philanthropic efforts. He conceptualized the acclaimed architectural look of ETC's Middleton, Wisconsin headquarters and the theme spaces in ETC's London and New York offices. Some of ETC's most famous groundbreaking pro products include the Source 4 ellipsoidal reflector spotlight, the EO series of controllers, including the ION controller you see in many of the theaters you work in, the expression lighting controller, the microvision, AKA the Flintstone board, the Source 4 PAR and Parnell, the sensor dimmer, the Nomad 
the new color source series of lighting fixtures, the source for LED, and so many others. So Fred, it's an honor <laughs> to have the chance to talk to you today about innovation in the industry. Thanks for having us here. My pleasure. Is that the only thing he, he invented? That's it? It's, <laughs> that's all? Well, <laughs> as you were reading that list of products, it strikes me that there are many that I don't touch very closely, such as an Ion or EOS console. I once patched, patched a dimmer on that. That's <laughs> Ann, that product is Ann Valentino's baby. And so a lot of those things that I get credit for um, really indicate why my job is great. There are 1,200 people at ETC now, 1,199 of them do all the work, and I get a disproportionate amount of credit for it. It's a pretty good gig, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, I've got the first question for you, Fred. Uh, so ETC is built on a resounding theme of innovation. So can you speak about how this philosophy has served you over the years? It's a, interesting. Honestly, sometimes I think ETC isn't terribly innovative in the sense that many of our early products were somebody else's concept, and we did it much better. Um, so with that self-deprecating statement out of the way, um, the uh, innovation, in my mind, involves a lot more than products. When we think about innovation, when you think about innovation, you say, what's the newest feature on this console? Why is that light brighter? When are we going to get a brighter light? I think innovation in an organization, in a company, in, ET in ETC, involves all sorts of different areas. The customer service, the fact that you can call us in the middle of the night and we'll call you back in 15 minutes, that was innovative to our industry. And that came from the passion of the people driving that department to be able to do that. Recently, um, I kind of made a challenge to the company of a new directive to get better at innovation, to be able to create change faster. Um, and it, at least within ETC, is very important for us to listen to everybody's ideas. You know, this is difficult because in my mind, I am the smartest man in the room, and I will tell you in 61 years, I've been disabused of this several hundred times, um, <laughs> that the, um, the important thing for me to learn and for us as a company to learn is to solicit ideas from throughout the company and not drive them down from the top. Mm. There is just so much creativity and innovation that can come from the people who are doing the job and are very close to the market. David. Yep. Oh, that's my question. Wait, I, I, I forgot something. My head is a little bit cold, so I need to change something here. There, there we go. Yeah, okay. That's a little better. Okay. Um, <laughs> So Fred, okay, you've I'll, just earned the 20 bucks. Got it. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I've got a whole, I'm a prop comic, you see. So uh, anyway, uh, Fred, what is the one choice you made in the past that led to a better outcome than you could have expected? You know, we all have these things that we think it's going to be a great idea, and then they turn out to be even a better idea. Mm -hmm. Was there one in particular? Well, I think I have to say the Source 4. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> The way that I was introduced to the Source 4 is Dave Cunningham and Greg Esikoff and his design team had developed this product. And um, Dave Cunningham's history, he was responsible for some of the innovation in light palette, in the prestige consoles for Colortran, in the ENR dimmer, the CD80 dimmer. So he had this huge experience. And we were wondering what he was, he had gone quiet. And we were wondering what he was doing. We heard rumors he was working with GE. And um, so then I was invited out to see him in California. And um, he present this was after signing non disclosures from hell. You know, mm -hmm. He wasn't going to tell me a secret <laughs> until we had signed our lives away. Um, and what they showed me initially on the Source 4 was the reflector, the HPL, prototype HPL lamp, and the lenses mm -hmm. on a light rail. Mm -hmm. And that was. Um, shot against uh, Altman 360Q lamped up to 1,000 watts. So this <laughs> is a 575-watt lamp, and the thing that two things really sold me on it. Um, finally, after the demonstration, I, the first thing I did is put the shutters together, and there was no flare. Mm -hmm. That's better than the average Leco. Um, mm -hmm. And then 
they had me stand 10 feet in front of the two lights. They turned on the Altman and I could feel the heat. Mm -hmm. Then they turned mm -hmm. on, they switched it to the Source 4 prototype and it was like getting hit in the face with a bucket of cold water. Mm -hmm. And it was 40% mm -hmm. brighter and it had 40%, used 40% less electricity. Now to put this in perspective, ETC had bought lighting methods the year before and we were almost bankrupt. Um, at the end of that first year, we had a debt to equity ratio of eight to one, which oh. had, had I gone to business school, I would have known that was bankrupt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you would have given up. <laughs> so so we, we were coming out of that financial crunch and the deal with Cunningham was that you had, he proposed was that we had to pay him $350,000 just to license the idea. Wow. And then we had to commit to about three quarters of a million dollars of tooling to um, be able to make the product. And then we had to pay him um, and pay him and pay him and pay him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the, the last kicker is he wanted us to commit to selling 15,000 of them a year. Now, he had had Wally Russell do a marketing study that said there were 70,000 Lecos sold in America a year, and Altman had 60% of the market. ETC had never made a spotlight. We actually used to private label Altman before that. And so um, with that commitment, I was able to talk him down to 10,000 units a year. And we went to the bank and we said, hey, you want to lend us $350,000 to um, license this technology? This was a bank that luckily had not pulled our loans the year before. <laughs> <laughs> so we really bet the farm on this. And um, we showed it at LDI in 1992, and it was an mm -hmm. orgasmic experience. The, you don't get very many. <laughs> You don't get very many of these in a career yeah. where um, we had a brand new booth, Dwayne Schuler did the lighting for it, nobody in the industry knew we were coming out with this, and we were so small they probably wouldn't have, we weren't on anybody's radar screen anyway. And that year, I think Century introduced the Leco 3 with a marching band when the show <laughs> opened. And they marched in and people finally got back to our stand and for the rest of the show it was like the stands around us were parking lots for people waiting to get into our stand. It was exciting. We won product of the year, we won booth design of the year, it was really a great time. We couldn't ship the product. That was in November. We couldn't ship the product until March the next year. We had shown the 50 hand-built prototypes that Cunningham did in his house. And so during that time, by the time we shipped the first one, we had orders for 17,000 of them. We had already wow. exceeded the one-year target. Mm -hmm. And in the course of this, we've made something close to 4 million Source 4 products. And it was really a product that revolutionized the world, Cunningham and Neskoff's and the design team's concept. But I think something that ETC brought to that is while it was a brilliant design, and it's proven to be a brilliant design, that nobody ever did it better. Mm -hmm. um, the, if you get a chance when you come out to ETC on Thursday, walk down the hallway to the left of Town Square, we have a string of Lecos from the 1939 Leco light to the Source 4 LED. And you get to see, what, what you do is you'll walk down and say, oh, there's the first one I used. Um, so it's wow. a, almost 100 years of history, but nobody has made a better light than the Source 4. Yeah. yeah, you know, you know, Fred. I, I remember, I remember back in uh, nineteen what was it ninety one when you guys introduced that. I was at that LDI. Ninety two. Ninety two, right? And and uh, and I remember the the reaction because I had just bought a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, worth of Century or Strand uh, <laughs> Licos for the Miami Opera, and I said, "Damn, I should have waited a couple of years. This is pretty amazing." But I also remember that your competitors' uh, 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 copies of that light and uh, them demoing them at, uh, at LDI a couple of years later, and uh, they, they're very proud of them. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, pull out that gobo and grab a hold of it. Yeah. And, and no one would do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I thought that was really cool that you guys came up with that product, that it really did change the industry, you know, because we're all using them. That's, that's basically what we use now. Mm -hmm. So following up on that, do you want to do four? I'll Go ahead. OK, so that's one that worked out better than you thought. Um, what is the one professional decision you wish you'd like to go back and change? That's a lot longer list. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's hard to see that. I mean, I can look at ideas that I drove through the company that didn't work, um, but nothing 
even the biggest failures I can think of gave us something else. We got mm -hmm. something out of it. Um, I might say, and this isn't the worst one, it's just an example of one. Um, in 1990, we bought the Iridian product line from Very Light. This was their architectural product line. And we thought this was really cool, and my ego was really tied up on this, buying a piece of Verilite, right? Because at that point, I felt that Verilite was an amazing company. I used to say that if we didn't have the best people, which is what I always say about ETC, Verilite had them. And so I was very enamored with this deal. Um, it turns out that it was the idea of putting that generation of mechanical moving lights in an architectural setting was a flawed idea. Um, however, what we got from that, and this is why you can, why a failure isn't always a failure, is we got some fantastic people. Mm -hmm. The people who came to us from Verilite as part of the Iridian group, Stephen and Stephanie Ricks, Troy Hatley, eventually Tom Littrell, um, although that was a more circuitous path, the fact that we got those people on our team softened the blow of a commercial mm. failure. Mm. Well, let's talk about the culture at ETC. Can you crystallize that down to three words? And do you have a great story to back it up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I have a great story, um, <laughs> uh, in my mind. Um, I guess the first would be people, the mm. second would be passion, mm. and the third would be probably innovation. Um, mm. Innovation as I defined it earlier. The people are a huge part of the company. Um, I joked about it in earlier today, or earlier in the interview, that they do all the work and I get the credit. The, from the very beginning, I think that one of the things that worked very well for ETC is we focused on getting and keeping the best people. Now, then you have to define what the best people means. Um, if you hire the best engineer, they're gonna to wanna to make really cool stuff. If you hire somebody whose passion is, passion is customer service, they're going to answer the phone. They're going to solve your problem as a customer. So if we focus on getting the good people, all those things that a business needs, happen naturally coming out of it. And I think we have some of the best people. Um, passion is part of that. Um, I think something that you will, if you think about the people you talk to at ETC, you deal with at ETC, most of those people have our backgrounds in production. We've been in theaters, we've been there at half hour when the lights are blinking and we know you can have half an hour to troubleshoot it. You can hold the house for three, maybe eight minutes, but then you strip and cover with front lights and turn the work lights on. But because we have been there, I think we can really support our customers very, very well. The other thing that I find about that category of people, um, and I imagine my, many of you have your background in production as well, um, by the time you, you get out of school or you start working professionally, it's really exciting. You travel the world, you stay in hotels, and you hit 30 years old and say, boy, I really want a real life. And <laughs> by the time somebody comes off the road, they can do anything logistically because they've moved too much crap and too few trucks in too little time. Mm. They can deal with prima donna engineers because they've dealt with talent. They can deal with... <laughs> 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 we have all dealt with that. <laughs> now I apologize to our entire R&D team. Um, <laughs> and they can deal with labor because they've dealt with the unions, but what, they ha what you have coming off the road, you cannot be taught, you're never taught in business school, and that's as trite as it sounds that the show must go on. Mm -hmm. That you know you have to make it. If the paint isn't dry, you tell the actors not to touch it, and you open. They're going to lean on it anyway. Um, but that, that ethic permeates the company. Um, Bill McGivern, who is our vice president of manufacturing, and he, his department has about 500 people in it, and as you get the tours of the company tomorrow, if you get the opportunity to do that, it's a very complex manufacturing scheme. He's a stagehand. <laughs> he, <came, laughs> he joined us, he was touring with the Elliott Feld Ballet, he's a member of Local 251 here, and he was off the road in the summer. He came in to test dimmers and simply never left. 
<laughs> As he moved through the company, he worked in project management and he rose to running manufacturing. Our shipping department and our manufacturing team, if the order needs to ship, they make it happen. And that's because Bill and the whole ethic of theater, the show must go on, has seeped into people in manufacturing who've never been backstage in a theater. Mm. And it's really critical to the culture of our company. Um, cool. That was a good story. That's a good story. <laughs> yeah, you know, you talk a lot, you know, you're talking about the people at ETC. Um, Look, he yeah, can talk is, and his lips aren't moving. Yeah, I know, it's amazing. <laughs> That's a good it's trip, the David. technology is fantastic happening right now. Uh, but as long as my sound works, that's all that matters. Uh, you know, one of the great stories, Fred, you know, in this industry was your decision to make ETC an employee-owned company. Uh, could you please tell our listeners why you decided to do this? Uh, sure, there's a long story here. Um, ETC was started by four people, my brother, Gary Buick, Jim Bradley, and me. Um, the initial capitalization, a term I learned 30 years later, was we had to buy an eight inch floppy disk drive that cost $1,200, so we each threw in $300 and got a quarter of the company. Mm. Along the course of time, um, the, we, one of our sail sailing friends had a factory, and he let me use his factory on the weekends to bash the sheet metal. His name is Bob Gilson, so at some point we either gave or sold Bob Gilson 10% of the company for $500. Kind of shows you what a joke the company was at the time. But looking back on it, it was the best investment maybe either of us has, had made because we couldn't have grown without his company's initial support. And it might be worth a little more than $500 now. Um, <laughs> so as we were growing older, and this was in oh, about three or four years ago, we were trying to figure out how to keep the company what would happen when we're not here? What, would, how, what is the future of the company? Coming up with a shareholders agreement on buying each other's stock or something like that. And we had meeting after meeting with our accountants and every time so we got close to a deal, one of our tax accountants would say, well, yeah, that works for you, but not my client. And so we couldn't come to a conclusion. Um, then I got the company, I got the shareholders together and now the shareholders, my, we, my brother's now a politician, so we bought him out. We bought Jimmy Bradley out early, and so it was Bob Gilson, Gary Buick, and Susan and me. And so we got together and I said, okay, let's come up, is there a, a directive we can give to our trustees of our estate that could keep ETC safe and intact? Mm -hmm. um, the trustees would be charged with maximizing shareholder value, creating as much money in the pockets of our offspring and our progeny, um, and that wasn't our motivation. So I asked, I asked the other shareholders, what is our definition of maximum shareholder value? Um, Gary Buick piped up right away and he said his vision, maximum shareholder value is ETC being a thriving independent company in 100 years. Mm. Perfect, we all agreed to this. And the reason this was so important to me is I've seen so many companies in our industry and other industries that have been crushed when they have gone public or been sold to a conglomerate that squeezes the blood out of the companies. Mm -hmm. And this is not what I wanted to happen to ETC. So um, there was an event that catalyzed this issue and we had to deal with it. And when we started looking at that, the idea of an employee stock option plan, um, we had toyed with before. And basically it's like a pension plan when you join the company, you're issued um, phantom shares in the company. And when you leave the company, you get the difference in valuation. So if the company becomes more valuable, it's as if you're an owner buying the stock and selling the stock. To be honest, we were a little afraid of it initially because we didn't understand the process. We were afraid it would be the inmates running the asylum. Um, <laughs> and we've got enough crazy people to <laughs> that we don't need to do that. But it turns out that's not the case because the employee stock the, the employees who participate in this um, don't get to vote on how much I'm paid or how much they're paid. The one thing they get to vote on is a decision as to whether the company would ever be sold. And in the, there are t tens of thousands of companies that are employee owned in this manner in America. And in the history of that, from what I learned, very few employee groups say, hey, this is a great idea. I'll take the cash now and lose my job. <laughs> mm. So <laughs> it was something that 
protected the company moving forward. Now, the other thing that happens, often this is used by the founders of the company to cash out. And you sell the company to the employees and you run away from it. Um, we, and in that sense, you set the valuation of the stock you're giving to, you're selling to the ESOP at as high as possible. And it's a great credit to my partners that we set the value of the stock at the lowest possible level that the IRS wouldn't scream at, which meant that it was incredibly, it, it helped bootstrap the value to the people. Another reason ESOPs are used in companies is if the company culture is sick and you, ha you want to create more buy-in from the employee group, you create an ESOP and now they're part owners in the company and they have a vested interest in the success of the company. To be honest, that was not a problem we had to solve at ETC. We have, over the years, a tremendous sense of unity within the company. So that wasn't something we had to do. And now looking back on it, what I find is that um, it is something we should have done a long time ago. It's mm -hmm. retroactively recognizing the contribution of the employees and finally getting around to sharing it. Mm -hmm. um, and this was done, there's, nobody had to put any money into it. We have a bonus plan on top of it. It didn't affect any of the other benefits. We simply have given a third of the company to the employees. And that is fantastic. Um, there's a great story of this. So I do this thing going around, and I'm not going to do it at the picnic tomorrow or Thursday, um, where I go bicycle around the factory in an ice cream suit and hand out Dove bars. Um, so I was doing this maybe the, shortly after the ESOP was announced, and I came up to one area in manufacturing, and some people came out, they heard the bells ringing, they came out, this kind of a Pavlovian response now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and one of the guys said, uh, and, I had Klondike bars and a, a bomb pop popsicle because you have to give non-dairy treats to people who are lactose intolerant, I find. <laughs> so this guy said, which one costs more? And I said, probably, <laughs> probably the Klondike bar. And he said, I'm going to have one of those. And my reaction was, watch out, you're eating your profits. <laughs> oh! <laughs> so somebody else in the crowd said, well, Freddie, have you always felt that way? And I said, pretty much. <laughs> That's a good businessman right there. <laughs> it's a great story. Well, this year, uh, ETC purchased high-end systems. Mm -hmm. So maybe tell us about that marriage of the two companies and how that's going to break new ground in innovation. First of all, we're still in the honeymoon phase, and it's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we hope that continues, and it will continue. Um, the story of ETC and high-end possibly joining forces goes back to about 1991, where we got very close. We danced, at that point, High End Systems was started by Lowell Fowler and Richard Bellevue and Bob Shackerel. Um, and at some point, they got in a patent battle with uh, Very Light. Both companies spent way too much money on it. They got, vent High End got venture capital into it, and the venture capitalists wanted out. And so we got to the final stages of the dance, and it just didn't make sense, and we stepped back and said, I'm sorry, we can't do this. Um, they eventually, and that was 1991, and about 1998, um, they, Generation Partners sold the company to Barco, um, and they became part of Barco's attempt to get, or concept of getting into uh, the whole event market. Um, when we looked at high end the first time, it was a very big, thriving company. When we looked at it the second time, and we did look at it at that, you know, eight years later, um, it was still a vibrant company, but had been squeezed a little bit by the venture capitalists. Um, mm -hmm. And then in 1996, uh, we were approached again by Barco saying, hey, you want to buy this company? And we looked at it, and it almost made sense again. And then in 1997, we entered the discussions again, and it made real sense. Now, how, part of that was ETC had, we actually do corporate strategies. This is how they keep me busy, is say, hey, Fred, make up a new corporate strategy we're not going to follow. Um, <laughs> but that will get you out of our hair. It's actually not that bad. It's more structured and valid than that. Um, that we had said that we wanted to get into the event market more, into concerts and all of that. We wanted a desk that, to do that, and we wanted to get into automated lighting. 
Um, and we also identified media servers as, and video manipulation as something we wanted to do. When we looked at high end, it had all three of those parts. Um, and the consoles are an important part of this because there is a difference between a console that come, is designed for theater, for cue to cue, linear lighting, to one that is designed for rock and roll. And we could have tried to, and you can busk a great show, a great concert on in the EOS, but we really didn't want to push EOS into a market it wasn't comfortable with. And so what we have with the hog and EOS is we have consoles that are very different DNA, and we don't have to spoil the DNA of them. Mm -hmm. So this will probably raise the question as well, what's gonna, what are hog and EOS gonna look like in five years? Are they going to start cross-pollinating more? Um, you will see things from one console appear in the other, but you will not see their core DNA change mm. because that would ruin both consoles. Um, so that's an advantage that, that High End brought. The other thing that High End had done, they had made a very bold decision several years ago to stop developing discharge or arc sourced mm -hmm. moving lights yeah. and to only do LED engines. And quite frankly, they did it a few years before LEDs were bright enough. But that bold decision put High End products and their product line well ahead of anybody else in the industry in leading LEDs into moving lights. And if I was to say, the next big change in our industry is we're going to see arc-based moving lights disappear, mm. replaced mm. by LEDs. Mm. Finally. Yeah. Mm. Um, well, well, yeah. They've reached the point now that just there is uh, just as bright, so you know there's really no need for for the uh, arc fixture anymore. You know, it's funny you say that, Fred, because you know this this show started because Stan wanted to buy some solar spots. And, solar theaters. Uh, uh, the quiet yeah, ones. yeah, solar theaters, right. Have you made and, enough uh, money to buy one yet on this? <laughs> what? We bought this show? Like nine, we bought nine of them. Oh, good. And uh, the decision was, that's how the show well, began. I just wondered if the yeah. Lumen Brothers were like a profit center. No. Uh, okay. David does it. David is a, a, David's a, a socialist. Fred, 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 you know how much you're paying us to do the show, right? So there you go. No, seriously. Uh, no, we're not. We're not for profit. Uh, I was teasing you don't have to defend yourself. I know. I know. But I, I'm only wearing this hat because, you know, I, I like it <laughs> personally. Um, no, but seriously, what, what the, the acquisition of high-end systems, I think, was an act, absolutely brilliant move. I mean, for everything you said about the control consoles they had, uh, about the, the venerable hog, uh, you know, so many programmers use this. And now companies, or, or not companies, but programmers can come to a company and almost have their choice of uh, consoles, of desks. And, and you're right. Uh, you, you guys immediately got this great, great series of moving lights. So, uh, you know, I, I think it was great. You know I what we really we got? What? We, we got 65 oh. we got 65 amazing people you've got an incredible yeah. people I we mean got, you're right yes absolutely the you're people, absolutely right the people who um, were at if you go through their longevity with high end systems a huge number of the 65 people were back there and when we looked at them 20 years ago and they held the flame of high-end systems and kept fanning it to mm -hmm. keep it alive during all of the different corporate ownerships of the company. And mm -hmm. what we found was this incredible passion, great people, the other two things in my list, um, that really have blended well with ETC, with the exception of you know, that Texas Longhorn thing and the bad <laughs> um, <laughs> that it's a, a remarkably comfortable marriage in that sense. Um, we are more than kissing cousins. They're really truly part of the ETC family, and I'm so proud to have them join. Well, that's great. I was lucky when we when we looked at those fixtures. Um, they brought me down to Austin mm -hmm. to see the factory, and I walked around and I met the people, and I went. This is, you know, it was, it was a substantial investment for our university mm -hmm. to buy those. And I'm told we were the first North American purchase of those fixtures because we wanted the silence. And we I just, like guinea pigs. What's that? We <laughs> like guinea pigs. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, was pretty, it was pretty great. And I just said, this, is, uh, this feels like a good place to make, make a bet on these lights. And we're, we're, we're happy. And what I talked about, about what is going to drive the change to LEDs, is that um, if you uh, deal with discharge lamps, 
in 300 hours they change color. Yeah. And right. from if you're a higher company, a rental company, um, you have and you have a demanding customer, you have to either relamp every time or sort your fixtures by mm -hmm. color temperature, whatever you need to do to satisfy it. If you're a lighting designer or a programmer and you have a mix of what is ostensibly white light, you have to color tune every fixture. That goes away with LEDs. The, you know, you're worried about a 20,000 hour life or a 50,000 hour life on an LED. Over that time, it won't substantially change color, noticeably change color, but 20,000 hours in a moving light is longer than the motors are gonna last. Yep. <laughs> and it's a lot longer than 300 hours for a discharge lamp. And this is yep. what's finally going to encourage the higher companies to get rid of the Mac 2000s. Why would, you know, they're happy to rent Mac 2000s. They paid for them in the first year and mm -hmm. they're just yeah. making a lot of money off of it, mm -hmm. but they're not as good a tool as an LED based light. And I think that's really going to create a sea change in that industry. And that's for the LED moving lights that have white light engine and dichroic filters. Mm -hmm. um, you might see something interesting tonight um, that shows what can happen if you do additive color mixing in mm. a, um, a light that might move. Wow. <laughs> uh, now, I can't, wait, I'm not gonna see this. I'm really looking, I want, you guys have to tell me what, that, what happens, all right? It's black, it's about this big. <laughs> <laughs> I've got That's a bold color choice, Fred, bold. <laughs> I've got one last question for you. Uh, the thing I've noticed about ETC over the years that sets it apart from everyone else and I was wondering why you went this way and the investment you've made. You've made a huge investment in education. Mm -hmm. Yes. You, you have made a, a difference in a lot of students' lives. Mm -hmm. You bring them to ETC, you have training sessions. When did that start with you? When did you decide this is something that's gonna be the It culture? came from a conversation, um, and I remember the conversation, I think Bill Gallinghouse and, mm -hmm. uh, and Valentino and, um, Tim Burnham at the time, and we were sitting around because a bunch of us came into the industry at about the same time, right out of school. In my case, I didn't finish that school part. Um, <laughs> and we came in and we were lamenting, where are the kids with fire in the belly? Where are the kids who had the passion that we had? And Tim Burnham actually solved this problem, or explained it. He said, I think I know what the problem is, and it's us. And he asked us all to think of somebody we would consider a mentor, who really encouraged us to individually move into the industry. And we all pictured somebody in our mind. And he said, now I bet that person isn't 10 years older than you, I bet they're 20 years older or more. And to a person, we said yes. And his premise was this, if you are trying to get 20 year old kids into the business and you're 30 years old, you're not established enough in your career mm. to think you can mentor them. And you look at them as your competition. And I think great teachers, some great teachers come out of college and they can teach right away, but a great teacher in any field is somebody who truly wants to make their students better than they are. Mm -hmm. And so Tim's premise was that we had to cross this threshold and really develop people directly. And that was at a time at trade shows where every company was trying to prove that they were dumber than the next by throwing huge parties at LDI. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we would throw a party for 1,300 of our finest customers <laughs> that cost $70,000 and they simply got drunk and didn't buy anything. <laughs> and, but you couldn't back out of these things because if you stopped your party, you're going out of business. So there's this, this really right. toxic situation. Mm. And we, <laughs> we took that opportunity to start a program that now something like 170 people have gone through, mm -hmm. where we stopped our party, we brought initially a dozen, now six students, graduate lighting students to the uh, LDI, um, and we had a very small reception with industry professionals we could bring together. And the first ones, and today the, they're great because you get all these old farts in the industry who want to cast pearls among the swine and um, <laughs> share their knowledge, and you get really hungry kids, and you're giving them a networking opportunity. Yeah. And that is built to a great program. Yeah. Um, those, some of the people, some of the students who've come into that program ran away from lighting, and that's fine if they found the, they wanted to do something else. Some have gone, some of are designing on Broadway, some are working for ETC. Um, and it's just nice to see that legacy. And so it becomes an obligation for us and for all of you as well to bring more of a next, a next generation up. Um, That's great. It's mental. So, 
Yeah. So, Fred, I, we want to thank you so much for discussing your career today and your thoughts on lighting and innovation. It's been a true honor talking with you. Well, yeah. Thank, thank you. you yeah. Thank you. So, so there's, there's one final thing. There's one final thing that I do want to say. There's one final thing. Last week, we interviewed Gordon Perlman on Light Talk. And uh, Gordon mentioned that you pioneered the idea of customer service among lighting manufacturers. And that changed everything. And that is so, so true. So listen, speaking for the Lumen Brothers, we'd like to thank you and all the great people who work at ETC and high-end systems for not only the amazing innovations you have given us, but also for the great customer service you supply when we are in the field creating theater and live entertainment. As you know, we can't always wait till Monday. And as they say, the show must go on. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. Well, that Hammond organ solo tells us that once again, you've spent a precious 55 minutes of your life <laughs> listening to Light Talk with the Lumen Brothers. We have been broadcasting from ETC's campus in Madison, Wisconsin. We would like to thank Fred for your time, insight, and great stories, and all the great people here at ETC and High End Systems who have been so kind and welcoming to the Lumen Brothers. You can listen to Light Talk every week on iTunes, Spotify, and any of the favorite podcast sites. And don't forget to join Light Talk on Facebook so that you can post your questions and comments. We got a lot out of one baseball cap there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you share that? Do you like pass it around to each other? Or can I get you each one? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, David? Thanks very much, guys. That was great. Thank all of you for joining us. And uh, it's time to move forward. First day of workshop. Have a great day. And we'll see you this evening for the Majestic Live. Thank you.